The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. Good afternoon. Thanks for uh, having me here. I'm uh, going to discuss a couple of rather unconventional piers currently being constructed as part of a bridge replacement project in Portland, Oregon. That's uh, the uh, Selwood Bridge. Um, the project owner is Multnomah County, which is uh, the county seat is in Portland, Oregon. It's the most populous county by far in Oregon. And I'm from T.Y. Lynn International. We are the prime engineering consultants on the project with uh, CH2M Hill is our prime, uh, our main subconsultant partner. They did the uh, in independent checking of the main span crossing, river crossing, as well as the approach engineering. And this project is being delivered under the CMGC or construction manager general contractor uh, procurement method, which was significant for reasons that will become clear momentarily. Uh, the unique design aspects that I'm here to discuss are the, um, the, the pier design follows a strut and tie design methodology, which is rather well uh, codified now. And the uh, layout and interaction of the column, the arch rib, the drilled shaft, and the pier reinforcing at large, the, uh, the rebar disposition follows the uh, force transfer models that were developed during that strut and tie procedure. And the contractor's uh, construction methods, as this is a CMGC project, the contractor was on board throughout the final design phase. So that entity was well aware of the design requirements for these piers. Here's uh, a graphic of the main span uh, river crossing. It's a three span steel deck arch. Uh, I apologize for the fact that there is steel on this job. Um, but we are supportive on concrete, I assure you. Uh, the span lengths are 365, 425, 465 feet. Uh, it's a weathering steel, and we have two piers out in the river that are stained uh, charcoal, stained concrete, as you see. Um, that blue dashed line represents the 100-year flood elevation, so the arch layout is such that the steel ribs should never be underwater. Um, now, you, you notice immediately, perhaps, that there's a large difference in substructure length from the, between the two river piers. That points to the variability in the riverbed at this location. It's, it's a highly variable subgrade. And that alone was one of the prime motivators for why these piers are built, being built in a perched configuration. The, the contractor's risk numbers were just too high with a conventional cofferdam at this site, trying to vibrate sheet piles in and place uh, cofferdam seals sufficiently thick to resist the buoyant uplift forces for a conventional pier uh, was just too restrictive. It, it was millions of dollars that were identified as a potential risk savings that could be averted. So that's primarily what drove this perched pier configuration. And we refer to it as perched because there aren't any foundation elements underground other than the drill shafts themselves. We don't have any conventional footings in this bridge. Here's a graphic uh, a close up of one of those two piers. Um, we have four 10 foot diameter drilled shafts at each of these uh, river piers. And the concrete element you see there, we, we've referred to this as angel wings during the life of this project. So uh, if I throw that term out there, forgive me, it's just the vernacular that's uh, been adopted for this project because I guess it looks like an angel in the river. Um, so that, that pier base is almost 14 and a half feet thick, tapering down to 11 and a half feet thick up top. So that's, that's quite massive and quite thick simply to encapsulate these drilled shaft elements. You know, 10 foot diameter, 9 foot 10 inch diameter to be more precise uh, is what was used here with uh, number 18 bars, grade 80 KSI um, 
so this is the perched pier that I refer to. And the, uh, then you see the conventional concrete bent column and steel arch ribs diving into the pier. So one of the other primary uh, engineering decisions that had to be made was just due to the geometrics of this system, that angel wing system, those, those arch supports are nine feet square out of the tips and 18 feet deep right here. So this is, you know, this is a two-story house uh, and nine feet thick into the screen. So simply providing minimum reinforcing for an element this large was quite an undertaking as far as constructability. So um, we decided to, rather than trying to um, reinforce each arch rib separately with straight bars and have all those bars fighting each other for position within the pier, we went with these radially bent bars, which I, I hope they show up well on that graphic. They're, they look a little bit better on my desktop, but it's these uh, blue U-shaped bars. And you have your typical tension compression force couple at the ends of the arch ribs here, which induces tension in these bars, of course. And so when you have a, a bent bar, of course, you have a radially bursting um, component of that force that has to be arrested at all times, and that's, that's never going in anywhere. That's not a live load, that's, that's just gravity there. So looking at section A on this next slide, I, I have a graphic of what my reinforcing layout is there. And I, I didn't make the contractor paint all these bars like I'm showing here, but this is just for your use and uh, identification. So I have a, a field of green hairpin vertical uh, U-bars to arrest those, the tension induced by these radially bent white bars, which are running up and down on the screen. Those bars pick up the tension, you know, resolve the, the bursting component of those radially bent bars, and their forces strut out to this sea of red supplemental vertical bars, as well as the um, typical pure vertical reinforcing. This is the footprint of the column here, so they have, uh, that column has its own bars. But then the sea of supplemental red bars are anchored well below the, the arch rib elevation, and those resist the load induced by that bend in, that, in the arch rib reinforcing. So as, as with any strut and tie model that's subject to variable load combinations, multiple models are required for design. And so I've illustrated a few controlling load cases in these next slides for the cases of longitudinal bending which is the day-to-day -day load case in a, in a bridge, uh, as well as transverse loading due to seismic. Uh, we are in a, a moderate seismic zone in Portland. So the longitudinal bending case, dead load plus unbalanced live load, thermal braking forces, what have you on a bridge, uh, I, I can resolve the, I, I can determine the compressive resultants in the columns and arch ribs from a moment curvature analysis and chase those loads down the compression side of the pier. That's the, uh, all these red lines. Down here I pick up the weight of the pier through a separate force, uh, force diagram. And I chase those down to the drilled shafts with this green tie element equilibrating the lateral components of these struts. Uh, pretty straightforward load path. Um, this is probably strut and tie. 101. Um, it's, it's one of the first cases you see probably in any strut and tie literature. Uh, the next one gets a little bit more interesting. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me get ahead of myself. Um, that statement there, strut thicknesses into the page, into the screen, are determined by load conditions at the shaft heads. That's uh, illustrated here. And <coughs> what I'm saying there is the strut thicknesses, the, the overall out of plane dimension of that force diagram that I just showed was driven by the zone of compression at the head of the drilled shaft supporting the wall. So I'm not utilizing all 11 and a half to 14 feet of that wall's thickness in resisting this compression. I'm only grabbing onto the zone of compression at the head of the drill shaft, which is also determined from a moment curvature analysis for the same load state, the, the same load combination. And then whatever this width of compression is, that determines the strut thicknesses that I have to work with on that previous slide. 
as well as how much tie reinforcing I can grab onto for that load case. So I have a sea of tie reinforcing bars down here. And for this given load condition, I know how much of this is really effective as providing the tie reinforcing that I just identified on that last slide. The other side of the pier is in tension. So I have the column tension resultants and the arch rib resultants are also determined from a, a moment curvature analysis. And those bars are anchored well down into the wall so that their force resultants can strut up and outward to the tension bars provided by the drill shaft. And I have layers of horizontal bars throughout the pier to pick up the, the resultant transverse component of these struts. Now to make that happen, I have these drill shaft cages which extend well up into the piers. Uh, these are 6,000 pound concrete piers and 80 KSI bars. And I think that the, the development length for that bar is probably 10 to 11 feet. But I run them 26 to 28 feet up into the pier. And some of those bars have heads on them simply to make that previous force transfer mechanism on that last slide capable of developing. So the bars are extended you know, maybe uh, two and a half development lengths up into the pier. And the column bars are embedded deeply for the same reason. The column bars are embedded 18 feet, where their development length is probably more like eight. Um, the, the drilled shafts are permanently cased within the river channel. Uh, that's for construction. We can't, can't get around that. But the confining and stiffness characteristics of that casing was included in the analysis. Transverse loading gets a little bit more exciting. Um, so we did nonlinear push analyses of these piers. We did our conventional response spectrum analysis for 1,000-year earthquake events with site-specific response spectra generated by our geotechs. And we pushed these piers with nonlinear characteristics to 1.2 times that resulting response spectrum analysis displacement. Um, so at the end of that push, we can assess the column and pier cross sections with more moment curvature, figure out what the resultant compression and tension forces are, and resolve them like this. So I have to get the compression force from that column down to the compression zone of these shafts. So if this pier is translating to the left, the zone of compression is over here and over here. So I chase that load down into the compression zones of these shafts, and I end up with a, a tie force requirement here. And I'm anchoring these column bars. Like I say, they're embedded 18 feet. I anchor these, these uh, column bars with further struts and horizontal ties to get those forces into the drilled shaft bars, which are in tension. I move down the pier, and I get to the soffit of that arch rib, the angel wing, and I can figure out what these, these forces are from that push, which accounts for overturning inertia as well as shear, chase that load out to the same compression zone of those shafts. The tie down here, the, the tie force requirement is just added directly to the tie force requirement for the column that was just determined. And vector addition accounts for the additive properties of the, the struts coming down the pier. And those are used in assessing the nodal stresses and the, uh, the impact of the tie strain on the adjacent node stresses and strut strengths accordingly. So um, a few, uh, in, in my abstract, I said that the contractor's methods would be briefly touched upon. So I have a few slides that I've um, put together here to illustrate that. The, uh, this, this is from another smaller engineering firm in Oregon. But this is a cross section through what has come to be called a perched box caisson. I like the term perched cofferdam better. But they've got a two and a half foot thick waste slab at the bottom of the piers that gets cast so that they can get all that reinforcing and form work in to build these piers. Um, a series of anchor piles around the perimeter of the system, as well as these large steel collars that are bolted to the permanent casing of the drilled shafts to resist the buoyancy force from an ordinary high water type flood, which is like a, like a two year flood. Uh, that flood elevation down to elevation minus four, which is the bottom of the pier. So this kind of, this kind of an engineering 
feet in itself. Uh, this is a floating coffer dam for all intents and purposes. And I have a few photos from construction uh, taken recently. So this is taken from the work bridge. You see three of the four shafts at this particular location uh, here. This is temporary shaft bracing, these square ties. Those aren't part of the permanent design, but that's, that's to stabilize the shaft cage. The permanent casing will be cut off at the bottom of the pier eventually. This large bump out here is for one of the angel wings, one of the arch ribs, and then the other one starts right here. And you see the series of sheet piles and everything is still flooded at this stage. And then I have two more photos taken um, around the same time, or around at, from the same spot basically, but a couple of weeks apart. This first one, I realize it's a little bit dark, but this first one, the, the water elevation is up around here. And the second one, it's, um, I'm sorry, I have that backwards. The first one, the water elevation is down here. The second one, it's up here. And that's because this is in the process of being sunk. Uh, it's a slow operation, but they are submerging this to get it down to the bottom of pier elevation. And they've spent the better part of probably three weeks now dewatering this thing. So this was taken about a week and a half ago, maybe two weeks ago. Um, whatever the deadline for uploading the presentation was, I think I was putting this together two days prior to that or the day before that. So th this slide, this picture is about two weeks old. Uh, I think this is a, a 10 inch pump, but every time I'm out there, they're just fast and furious, pumping the, furiously pumping the water out of this system. Uh, I think that they are anticipating having it dry by the end of this week. And then they'll start bringing out the, the number 18 bars that make up the, the tie at the bottom of the pier as well as everything else that goes in it. Um, but this is the first of two. The, this is the eastern pier and the, the one to the west is also it's being built in the same way but their critical path is such that this dewatering operation has been going on at this particular location right now. They'll hop over to the next one later in the summer. Um, so I don't have a conclusion slide, but I'm happy to take any questions that you have.